My name is Mel Frank. Uh, I'm author of the Marijuana Grows Guide, Marijuana Grows Insider's Guide. I'm the publisher of Rob Clark's book, Hashish. Uh, and I've been growing since 1968. First started in New York City in an apartment. Uh, moved to California in 76. And uh, have grown indoors, outdoors, greenhouses. Uh, a couple of times on some real scale. But most of the time pretty small uh, stuff. Uh, I still breed, I, st I still consult. I still write, I still photograph. I recently had, this last year I had two uh, photo art shows, one at M&B Gallery here of archival marijuana photographs and one in New York City at Ben Ruby Gallery. That was last fall. Uh, so currently I'm still doing that, still breeding and uh, do some consulting. Yeah. My name's uh, Kyle Castanon, the founder and grower of Palomar Craft Cannabis. Been growing in a two-car garage. Started growing in a two-car garage back in 2009, and over the years, I've scaled it up to a 32,000 square foot mixed light facility. And uh, you know, Mel and I are actually having some pretty good conversations about uh, you know, the industry and how it's been changing over the years. Uh, some of the things that we were really talking about it was just you know the skill sets that we've developed over the years as, just, as growers. Yes, well, and one the thing we both agree on that that's probably the biggest problem in the cultivation uh, aspect of of the industry is the lack of true master growers. That we just see too many grows fail because the master grower really isn't a master at growing. Uh, and that's something that uh, should be changing because there's so much money involved in it, so much at stake in it, that uh, I think more and more people who are growers will take what they're doing much more seriously in terms of the, the science, the technology that's available now. Uh, because. When you grow indoors or in a greenhouse, you need to control the environment as much as possible. Uh, not only in the cleanliness aspect of it, but also in, in terms of humidity and of course the CO2, uh, your fertilizer and everything else. It all has to be monitored. Uh, it has to be monitored consistently. And the, the grows that, that I've seen that are really successful uh, are set up in a way that there are uh, remote monitors in every room that are telling them what their humidity is, what the temperature is, uh, so that it falls within a, a, a BDP range that's healthy for the plants. This way here, they, you can avoid getting things like powdery mil mildew, so you never have to treat the plants with, with something before or after it happens. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the days of Eagle 20 are gone. <laughs> and so people have to learn how to grow things, uh, grow s clean crops. Uh, without resorting to these things that we used in the past. Yeah, I mean, like we were just talking about some horror stories of right. these, these like real estate developers, new entrants into the industry coming in, um, hiring some guy from Colorado who says he's a master grower, dumping millions of dollars into facility, um, right. installing the wrong technology, and just losing everything. And we're seeing that a lot in California over the last couple of years as legalization has happened, these regulations mm -hmm. have been implemented, and it's just really heartbreaking. Um, it's just some of the bad right. advice and just wrong advice uh, that traditional agriculture people are giving to cannabis growers and saying, you know, we would recommend one set of equipment, but say a guy who grows tomato or corn would say, oh, you don't need that. It's like it's a heat tolerant plant. It's like, well, how do you know it's a heat tolerant <laughs> plant? How many, <laughs> many cannabis growers have you had? Right. <laughs> and so it's just a lot of bad advice and there. A lot of people are just not valuing the skill sets that we've developed over the mm -hmm. years at great risk. Right. Um, because they just think it's a plant, and it's really, uh, it's really heartbreaking to see some of these just like very simple mistakes that are costing people millions right. and millions of dollars. Also, the practices that uh, that a lot of growers had just aren't accepted in the in the industry anymore, simply because uh, your product is going to be tested; it has to be completely free of pesticides or fungicides uh, uh, and so forth. Whereas before, it wasn't, and so people just used whatever they could to finish a, a crop. And if they're living in a place that had a lot of humidity, uh, a lot of cool temperatures, they were gonna end up with powdery mildew or bartritis and that they would treat with fungicides. And you just can't do that anymore. Yeah, one of the th uh, products you mentioned, Eagle 20, uh, that was a very common uh, fungicide to get rid of powdery mildew or bot or some of these other things, right. but that shows up on test now. Right. And even when you extract it, that can actually you know, pass through the extraction process and go into your concentrates. Right. Um, and people are struggling with that as well. Yeah, yeah. in fact, people thought that they were clean of that because they would use a, a, a clone. 
uh, in a, a clone that came from a plant that had been treated with Eagle 20, but it's still it's a systemic and it would end up and it could still be detectable. Uh, the other thing I think that uh, has really hurt the cultivators in terms of some of these big indoor and greenhouse grows is when they accept clones. Everybody is so interested in getting new genetics, better genetics, and so forth. They accept clones that they think are clean, and only to find out that they end up with russet or broad mites, uh, the mites that are microscopic, and take a long time to discern that you actually have them until you, you see your plants failing. Uh, so I think that that's something I've seen in the industry that's very common. Somebody brings in a clone from a trusted source, and uh, that trusted source shouldn't have been trusted as much. Mm -hmm. seen that. So something else we were talking about, just as industry is changing, um, you know, you've got indoor cultivation. For the first time, you can put up these high-tech greenhouses. Um, where do you think the industry is really going, like as far as the cultivation methods? Right. Well, cultivation, I think for bulk, uh, it'll probably be straight outdoors, although straight outdoors has its problems too. Uh, you know, a lot of the, the areas that have been traditionally farmed, like in Carpentaria and places like this, uh, you know, the soil may have a lot of heavy metals in it. It may have, uh, you know, contaminants from past growth from years ago. Uh, that are still going to be drawn up and they're going to be detected. I tend to agree. I mean, you see a lot of bulk coming out of the NorCal market, right. the Carpinterias, uh, Santa Barbara. Right. Uh, but for, it's going to be for extraction. Right. I mean, right. that's a whole it's new industry. Flowers. Right. is right. extraction. Right. And that has its own sets and challenges too with now. Like if you do have heavy metals, that could pass off into the concentrates right. as well. Yeah, it's gotten a lot harder. Um, yeah. Something I've just been focusing on. Uh, is just some of my friends who are trying to get legal and come into the industry. We're trying to help them do all their paperwork and uh, get them licensed and right. everything. And because what they said, there's about 50,000 growers in the state of California in 2017, wow. and now there's like 5,000. <laughs> so what happens to the other 45,000? Right. And they're not going to close up shop either. They're just yeah. pushing everything out the back door like they always have. Mm -hmm. But that undermines the whole system. Yeah. Um, we got to help to help to change that. I think it'll be interesting how this all flushes out. I think that that there will always be a, uh, a craft industry for flowers, but flowers are probably going to become less and less a part of the, of the industry as more and more goes into the concentrates. Uh, I think California will probably be one of the last places where the use of flowers di diminishes uh, because we just have a, a long history of it and that's, that's the way it's been consumed for so many years. I know uh, personally, I still like to smoke a good joint. I, it's one of the best things to do. Uh, that and maybe a, a rosin hit is nice. You also get the whole plant there. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was never big on concentrates. I mean, other than the fact that they're really strong, uh, <laughs> you know, they'd just be missing the whole plant feeling that you get when you have all those different terpenes in with, with your smoke. But see, that was my problem with vape pins and yeah. everything like that. Like, you know, there's some really good vape pins out there, and sure, the flavors are great, but it felt mm -hmm. like such a one-dimensional high, Yeah. right? I mean, you get, you smoke it, you get high, for like really high for like 10 minutes, and then it's gone. Where right. some of like the organically grown, the sun-grown stuff that, that I get to smoke every now and then, mm -hmm. it's just, it's beautiful, yeah. and you, you're high for like two or three hours, but you're not overly like, oh my God, I'm going to die high. Right. Like, um, yeah, and well, like, I think, I think the extraction still has a ways to go in some cases, but the rosin, oh, oh man. Definitely does, yeah. <laughs> Well, with the extraction, you're, you're basically putting in uh, your terpenes that are coming from other sources, right? They're coming right. from lemons, you're lemony. Uh, and so they're just putting it in. So when, you, when you're when uh, you smoking that in a vape pen, you do get, you get a strong flavor, but it's, it's really artificial mm -hmm. because they can't put in the 30 or 50 or how many terpenes there actually are. Many of them are there in minuscule amounts. So they put in the most prominent. So there's four or five of those terpenes they might put in to try to match the terpene profile they get back from a lab. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, you know, it works in terms of you get some flavor, but you still don't get the same effect that you would if you were smoking the flower it came from. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, it's yeah. like once they extract it out of that matrix that the, that the plant has you know, evolved into, it just, it cheapens the, the high. Mm -hmm. I mean, we grow one strain called Saturn OG and like it's really mild, but it'll last for three or four hours. <laughs> Um, and and, you, and like you try extracting that, like yeah, with a BHO yeah. or even rosin, yeah, the rosin actually gets the closest thing. I think they're only yes, using they're really using heat and pressure right. for that as opposed to like a solvent. Um, and I think it's just yeah, beautiful. But you're right. Like we're seeing over the years, 
um, you know, extracts are taking more and more of the shelf space. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, for ease of use. I mean, who doesn't like a vape pen? Right. Yeah, who doesn't right. like a vape pen? Right. You can smoke at a bar and things like that. Right. Like, I think they're cool. But if you really want to taste the plant and the, the craft that went into it, um, I mean, yeah, the whole flower, I think, yeah. it's the way to go. So you think, but uh, over time, less and less uh, flower will actually be consumed. Yeah, I think it will always be that craft industry, just like beer. Mm -hmm. You know, you have Budweiser, and then you have all sorts of little craft ones, local ones. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's funny, you mentioned the, uh, how long it lasted. Mm -hmm. And back in the day, in the 70s, when I was breeding, uh, I did, I, I produced Afghani one and Durban poison for the industry. It was one of my claims to fame. Uh, <laughs> is I would give out numbered joints to people to smoke and have them report back to me. And one of the things I always told them, always try to you know, do your comparisons at the same time. Like mm -hmm. if you smoke at night, eight o'clock at night, always do it at that time. And then tell me how long it lasts. Because how long it lasted to me was the best indication of how strong it was, mm -hmm. right, really. So it's funny. Uh, the Saturn <laughs> so I think OG, it's probably stronger. Well, the Saturn than the OG that uh, that uh, I have was an Afghani cross. So thank you. <laughs> Could have done without you. Um, but yeah. Uh, so some of the things we were talking about too was just all these new entrants to the market. Um, one of the first panels was talking about the mergers and acquisitions. There's a lot of money coming mm -hmm. in. Uh, as someone who pioneered the industry, how does that make you feel? Like you've got these guys who, have <laughs> two years into the industry. And all of a sudden, have these multi-million dollar valuations, and it's like, I don't know about you, that, that kind of pisses me off. <laughs> well, it does me too. I mean, see, people come in who have money uh, and are able to make more money because they have money. They don't have a skill set or anything else, but uh, that's, that's, unfortunately, that's the way capitalism works, yeah. you know. Like, like it or love right. it, I guess. So. Right. Fortunately, yeah. we all can still grow our own marijuana, and I think... You know, uh, seeds and that will always be part of the industry. Mm -hmm. uh, what hasn't been adopted here is uh, really the autoflowers, mm -hmm. uh, like they are in Europe. It's it's the biggest seller in Europe are the autoflowers. That and then, and then feminized seeds. Uh, but here, not so much. What do you so think that is? Like, I'll be honest. I've been growing for ten years and I've never grown autoflower. I mean, it's mm -hmm. it didn't really fit into my kind of production system, right. I guess. Right. But I mean, it's. As far as California goes, or Southern California cultivation guys, it's like, we just don't do them. But why, why do you think that is? Well, for one thing, we don't worry about the, the uh, length of the season as much as they do in other parts of the country. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can, I can still grow like Colombian in my backyard here in Los Angeles. Really? Right? Well, most of the country, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, it, only because it's still, it's still flowering in November, December. Mm -hmm. uh, the I, autoflowers, I mean, I don't have much experience with them. I, I did grow autoflower uh, because I wanted to learn a little bit about its genetics. And, and what I did is I crossed it with, uh, with uh, uh, a male autoflower with six different uh, uh, varieties that I had that I knew how strong they were. Now, I, I tested, the one that I had tested was a Pakistani that had tested it at about 17% THC. And when I crossed it with the autoflower, uh, and I had it tested, it came out to 8.5% THC, exactly one half huh. of what the original was. Mm -hmm. And that's because the autoflower doesn't contribute anything to it, hmm. or at least, at least the autoflower I had. Mm -hmm. So it only had one uh, THC synthase hmm. versus the two it had when it was a Pakistani. So that's how it came out to half of what it was. Hmm. Now, it may have been a coincidence, but it seemed to make sense to me. Huh. Right, so. I wonder another reason why we never just got into them too. I mean, but like those, Southern California, everything's indoors. Right. <laughs> uh, the bulk of my career was all indoor cultivation. Okay. Only when it was like fully legalized under Prop 64, it's like, okay, I'll drop a few million dollars at actually building a real facility with sensors. And right. I mean, prior to that, I had my metric where it's like, okay, I have to spend three thousand dollars to light, right? And that's for all my ACs, my lights, the rent until mm -hmm. you get to the first harvest. And you had to do it as cheaply as possible, so you could make all your money back in about six months because mm -hmm. six months is about the average length of time that a police investigation takes before they rage it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of how I used to set up all my old right. indoor grows. But now for the first time ever, I mean, you know, we're all licensed and permitted and everything, and it's like, mm -hmm. okay, wait, we can actually, you know, we, we have a return on investment, we can actually, yeah. you know, kind of forecast. And it's like, we're gonna put these really high-tech sensors and data logging things, exactly. remote sensors, um, for, the f for the first time ever, because we're not worried about getting the door kicked down in six right. months. Right. Uh, so that's been really exciting for me personally. Um, you know, as I started in my garage and always wondering if I'm going to get my door kicked down, which we have, and that was fun. Um, and yeah, 13,000 square right. foot indoor space, you know, gone in 
about a span of eight hours, like two years in there. So, but now you finally can, and I think that's like going to be great for our industry too, as we're, you know, I think the, the indoor cultivation definitely has a place in the market for small craft producers, and I've seen like just amazing flower grown by you know really really high skill set guys. Um, but I think it's going to be important too um, for just environmental and regulatory purposes. The uh, mixed light greenhouses are going to be a big thing with all the new yeah. carbon <clears throat> taxes that they're starting to hit up the indoor guys. So. I agree. I mean, the the idea of using all artificial light to grow your plants is just a, such an expense. No. It really is. Uh, a lot of wattage. The water problem indoors is not a, not really a problem. You should be able to recycle almost all of your water. That, that's no problem. You just collect it off your HVACs or your de dehumidifiers, and it has nowhere to go. You're in a sealed system. Yeah, I think, there's, system, so. I think there's a lot of misinformation yeah. on the cultivation side, especially with the cities and the state. Yeah. You remember a few years ago when we were in that drought, it's like all the our news articles are saying, like, oh, it's, it takes six gallons of plant you know, every day for right. cannabis. And it's like, no, it doesn't. But that's caused a string of problems with the regulatory agencies right. in the cities and saying, well, you have to recollect and mm -hmm. reuse all your water. Right. It's like, okay, so I'm going to save about, you know, 5% of my water usage, but I'm going to up my filter usage by about 100 times. So I'm going to save a bunch of water, but I'm going to generate a ton of waste with yeah. all the filters that we're, like, because I'm using to recapture all this water yeah. that you're, you know, so worried about. So getting them to understand all that has been really a challenge for, for me, and, and mm -hmm. as we've been working through all these regulations that seem to change at a dime, uh, <laughs> right in the middle of things. So, now, how does that make you feel? Like, now you're coming from... You know, your first book was published in 74. You know, here we are in 2019. Right. Did you ever think this would actually happen? <laughs> uh, actually, in the 70s, I thought it would be legal by 1980. Really? Well, <laughs> well the problem, <laughs> you see, you, you had uh, most of the, most of the uh, uh, more enlightened municipalities or states were starting to decriminalize it, all right, make the penalties a lot less. Uh, and you, you had Carter in the White House who seemed sympathetic. You also had the first uh, uh, U.S. report come out, uh, or recent report, the uh, Saffer Commission. And they basically recommended that it be decriminalized. They said that mm -hmm. criminalizing it caused more, more harm than good. Uh, unfortunately, Nixon said, F you, and just threw out that, paid no attention to it, and created the DEA. That's really what happened. <laughs> And, and that was when the war uh, on then, drugs really in 19, started. By 1980, you had Rockefeller come in with determinate sentences on drugs, which changed everything. And uh, you know, and uh, Reagan came in, and then you started to have uh, uh, programs like Camp. Mm -hmm. That was a California program of helicopters flying over the countryside to find marijuana. And that's when uh, indoor cultivation really right. started. Right. That it really started pushed the uh, indoor cultivation absolutely. Uh, and then you also had Operation Green Merchant mm -hmm. in the 80s, which uh, that started the whole round of them just coming and not arresting you, but just taking all your shit. Right? Uh, I mean, it really. I've been there. It was some <laughs> tough times. It was some tough times then. Yeah. Right. I th thought we should mention something about our experiences with lights. Mm -hmm. uh, people who want to grow their own, own pot. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, my experience is you can grow it with pretty much any light, and some lights are better than other lights. And the more recent ones, like uh, the yeah. ceramics, yeah. right? I've grown with a little 315 ceramic, and it's, it's amazing uh, how much you can get from that one little light. And you were saying that you're trying some 600s now? Oh, yeah. yeah. So yeah, the light-emitting ceramics is a new thing. I mean, everyone knows about the LEDs, the light-emitting right. diodes. Um, you know, as a guy who loves doing R&D projects and side-by-sides with it, it's like, never really got the LEDs to work, especially in flowering. Okay. Uh, but the light emitting ceramics, like for veg, absolutely, 100% uh, embrace the, that technology. I mean, we were using 600 watts metal highlights. Um, mm -hmm. We've swept them out, you know, one for one with a 315 watt, uh, those light emitting ceramics, and it's great. Actually worked a bit yeah. better. And the same on the power belt. So I'm hoping yeah. some of the technology will catch up where indoor cultivation yeah. uh, actually could be, you know, economically viable for a lot of guys because in other states too they only they're only allowing that i think massachusetts is like like that um to an extent where the most of the cultivation is all indoor and you know, it's probably not that good for the environment we're using about 100 watts a square foot uh, but i think some of the led stuff and the lacs could help get there but yeah. at the end of the day i think 
the big production is going to be into you know mixed light greenhouses like mine, and people are going to be more and more comfortable in investing in that yeah. infrastructure. Especially as you scale up, you have to invest more per square foot in that infrastructure mm -hmm. to actually keep you climatized. And you know what we talked about earlier, it's just like right. you have to have a stable climate first. Yes. Right. <clears throat> Yeah, I, th I think the LEDs will uh, be a big part of the industry, even even in flowering. And you it, said it, you actually got them to work, right? I've never been I to have do that. that. <laughs> <laughs> I suck at LEDs. And the, uh, uh, the, the uh, greenhouses with supplemental lighting, I think, are, are really where it's going to be in terms of, in terms of uh, the industry. Because if you have a greenhouse and just rely on your natural crop, you're getting one crop, maybe mm -hmm. two crops. Uh, but you can push it, you know, and get maybe three to five crops a year easy mm -hmm. in a greenhouse if you have supplemental lighting and darkening. I mean, so. Yeah. And that's gonna, basically what you guys yeah, do, right? Yeah, I mean, pretty much. I mean, you know, what people, and this kind of goes back to earlier conversation of these master growers, I mean, you need to design a cultivation system first, and then you design your facility around that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we grow in organic soil, and we have a four-week veg time, you know, two weeks in a one gallon, two weeks in a five, you know, eight to nine weeks in flowering, you know, give or take. And, uh, you know, we have four... Uh, compartmentalized flowering zones and we get five harvests a year per zone right. so for us we're gonna get about 20 harvests this year about every 18 days or so just like <laughs> clockwork so um, and that's hard for a lot of guys understanding right. project management and scheduling right. and things so like that. so you have to sync that with your your drying and yep. your and your manicuring and all that exactly. so it all has to be figured out in terms of that timing right, yeah, right. Or otherwise you're gonna be really unbalanced I mean I can't tell you a main reason why a lot of these guys are failing right now is one because you know they hire someone from whoever Colorado and there's a master grower and they put together a system they think works and once they actually start really running the thing it's like oh crap our drying room's not big enough well now we've got to do that right. now we've got to pull permits and do this fix this and run electricity and it's like oh crap this isn't big enough or this is too big so now we have a lot of wasted space where you could have thousands of square feet just line follow and it's like well that's not making any money for you and mm -hmm. now you've got to pay the taxes on that right. because that's how much square footage of canopy that you have and that city is going to want your tax money. So okay. uh, I think that's a really big problem is people don't understand that. They just go in, they acquire land, they build a facility, and then they try to shove a cultivation system into that. Yeah. And now it's really unbalanced. And so and that just leads to a lot of losses and you know, decreases right. in efficiencies. Um, and yeah, like, like I think we've seen it both. <laughs> it's, it's like see a lot of problems with guys who don't understand right. that and don't value those skills. I mean... Uh, yeah, I've had guys tell me who are really willing to write me a check. It's like, well, your skills doesn't really matter. Like, we'll just get some Dutch guy in there. It's like, no. <laughs> like, Absolutely. Yeah, so right. that's really disheartening. But it's, um, and it, but then it, but always in the end, it's like those guys are failing right now. So you know, mentioning the Dutch just reminded me of something funny. Is is this was a, this is just maybe about eight months ago, I got a a, a, a DM through my Instagram account mm -hmm. from a guy in in in. Uh, the Netherlands, in Amsterdam, actually. And he asked me if I knew anybody, any master grower who were willing to come to Amsterdam and, and grow for him. He had mm -hmm. the facility. And I wrote back saying, what do you mean? You're in Amsterdam. You should have, <laughs> like, tons of them. He said, no, they all went back to California. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nicer weather out here. <laughs> so, yeah. Does anybody in the audience have any questions or anything? Cultivation questions, no. licensing questions? Sure. The, the question was about automation, uh, increasing efficiencies through robotics and reducing your labor costs. And yeah, I think that's really important. I mean, as we get taxed more and heavily more regulated and things like that, uh, we're looking like guys like us are looking for any way to reduce those costs when you're at scale. Um, I mean, for us right now, our biggest cost is labor. It accounts about for 55% of the cost to produce one pound or one uh, plant, pound, plant, whatever you want to call it. And um, especially depending on what you know, state or municipality you're in, there could be a lot of labor shortages and things like that. So, I mean, I'm out in the middle of nowhere right now, and yeah, staffing can be a challenge, so it'd be great if I could have some more automation. And so, you know, we're definitely putting a lot of that stuff in place. We're looking to uh, big ag for some of their technology, mm -hmm. like moving benches is one, the Dutch, or another yeah, guys. The sliding, yeah, benches. the sliding benches. Right. We've got rolling benches right. that go side to side, but now I need a bench that goes front to back, because my greenhouse is about 100 feet long, that's a heck of a trek when you're like trying to move plants up and down it every, all day. Um, so what yeah. What about trimming? Do you use uh, do you use automatic trimming? Mm -hmm. We do a little Machine light trimming. Rope. I mean. Well, because that kind of goes back to a, a balanced system too. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if we have like a 20,000 square feet of canopy, you know, we're harvesting about a little over 2,000 plants every 18 days, um, and with that kind of 
and even there's still a degree of seasonality in our greenhouses too. I mean, the sun's really weak right now. So, you know, we need, in, we need staff up and staff down throughout the season. So, but if we were to hand trim everything, um, we would need 70 full-time trimmers. And what happens right. if I'm two days, you know, ahead of schedule and I've got 70 trimmers like, hey, I'm like, sorry, you gotta take the next couple of days off. Right. That would piss them off. Yeah. So we use a light, uh, a little bit of automation when it comes to our trimming to mm -hmm. have about a full-time workforce of about 20 full-time guys. Um, but I mean, they get better at their job. I'm able right. to cross train them. So now they also know a little, little about trimming, about processing, the packaging, mm -hmm. cultivation, and they like that. And so a lot of my uh, entry level guys and some of the guys who are kind of new, they get to see every part of the company because we can move them around because we are using some of that automation. Mm -hmm. So they're more bought in. Um, you know, we get to see who's going to be a good performer instead of just having a head count of like 50, 70 people. And that's all they're doing. And so we are able to reduce our turnover rate because of that as well. Right. Yeah, just by implementing some of those automations. And I think that's important if you're not, if, and I think a lot of our um, peers in the industry are still kind of stuck in that mindset of, well, this is how it's done for 20 years. We have to hand trim yeah. it. We're going to do this, going to hand water it. And it's like, yeah, that works great at a craft level if they want to stay small. Right. Works great when it's illegal also. Yeah, right? exactly. <laughs> when you don't have to pay payroll tax or the right. workers comp yeah. and all this other great stuff. Um, but it, it's in, it definitely has to be a part of the new world that we, the new mm -hmm. regulated world that we live in, because those are just sacrifices you have to make to not get your door kicked down right. or guys yeah. drop in from Black Hawk helicopters on your head. Right. Like these are just things that we're all gonna have to accept. And, uh, and our, we've embraced a lot of that stuff because we're not trying to get rid of jobs, we're trying to make the jobs we have better. Yeah. Right? I wanna pay the one guy who's running those you know, systems a lot more money. Mm -hmm. I wanna give him more opportunities because we can expand the company right. that way. Instead of having, you know, a dozens of minimum wage employees like yeah. let's have a bunch of salaried guys are actually making money good benefits and that's for my company that's really important i mean there's only two things in my company it's people and plants that's it yeah right you, you have good people they grow good plants plants produce good weed sell some good make good money it, it right back yeah. to the people and that's it so yeah we do use a lot of that stuff just to balance the system and make it better jobs for everybody yeah, yeah. What, what are some of the, the automation technologies that you're most excited to like play around We're really excited about, yes, like a fertigation system called Rhythm that we're just mm -hmm. having installed. And so that can really um, just dial in some of our systems further. It's like we can actually see like how dry the plant is and what that time, like, okay, here's when I watered first, this is my dryback time. And the system will know exactly based on right. the parameters we set in it, when to water it again. And some other right. data that we collect, okay, what's that runoff look like? What's the tissue analysis of the plant look like? What's the soil holding uh, what's uh, still inside right. there? And so we can kind of, go back and program and dial in these strains even further. So like we've developed a regimented system where, you know, we know the genetics of the strains, um, you know, like my Saturn OG is an Afghani cross. And so, you know, I want to borrow that. Right. <laughs> um, and we can actually optimize the system faster because we have that good data set of collection. We know it's like, okay, this Afghani likes this kind of, this kind of fertilizer blend or this little bit of soil difference. Um, and if we find another strain that might have another Afghani cross, it's like, okay, well, we've already got a baseline for that genetic. Uh, so we can optimize it faster by doing that. But I'm really excited about that. Um, you know, the environmental control systems like Link4, we're working with them pretty closely to like, um, I, love, I, I, have a, I love it and I hate it when some of these companies say, no one's ever asked us that before. And so that must be, I have a new idea that's must be, that might be cool. But then it's a pain in the ass to actually implement it. <laughs> right. so, um, so I'm really excited with kind of the data collection and now we've, we've hooked up a lot of those servers and sensors to a SQL Server database, and we can actually pull all the data out of that and yeah. mash it up with like these data visualization software. Yeah, so. I think the the the, <laughs> the thrust of it is is, is uh, data, is that collecting more and more data about how much water they're using and uh, and so forth, and really getting it down to a very fine art. Yeah. Uh, it's really when you, be, you get the most production, right? Mm -hmm. The cleanest production, also. Right? And it's so. it's repeatability too. I think that's yeah. yeah. Uh, the question was, are we using data to, uh, you know, data-driven decisions on what strains to grow during what seasons, um, and I'm also doing breeding. Um, we're not doing breeding anymore because of an accident I had years ago where I seeded, you know, 20 lights worth of plants. Uh, so no breeding on the side. I think there's a lot of amazing breeders uh, in the United States right now and in California. Well, that, that's something, though. That's a, that is a good point in terms of at different times of the year, uh, different, different uh, cultivars will respond better or worse. You know, like uh, you might be looking at a shorter season 
one for, for a winter crop. Uh, uh, yeah, for us, I mean, um, we really cut back our production of certain sativas yeah. because sativas, they simply ha like much, much more light. I mean, sativas evolved around the equator. Uh, they have a longer flowering period. Um, and also, the Southern California market doesn't really like a lot of sativas in the wintertime anyways. Um, I mean, right now, like if I had you know, 10 pounds of a sativa, I couldn't sell it to save my life. Um, but as the summer months come in, uh, they become much more popular. And so we're using data to just, you know, what's the market demand and also what our environment allows us to grow the most efficiently. Because if you have a sativa that wants a lot of light, and right now our light is so weak, it's about 70% you know, weaker than it is at the peak of summertime, you just won't get the yield out of that. But you're still using the same amount of you know, fertilizers, nutrients, soils, mm -hmm. labor to actually still produce that. So your cost to produce a gram of a sativa flower in wintertime is much, much higher than a comparable indica. So absolutely, we use that like 50%. Yeah. I mean, these the sativas, like, uh, the question was how much higher, and it's about 50% higher. These things like a lot of light to get that kind of yield yeah. out of them. I mean, Blue Dream, right? Classic yeah. sativa. Um, loves a lot of light, great yielder. But, like, I've seen guys who just grow beautiful Blue Dream, but only under very specific conditions, and one of those is a lot of light. So. Yeah, I mean, the pure sativas, uh, like here in Los Angeles, they'll still be go going in November and December. Mm -hmm. right? Right. And typically really you harvest time. them yeah. like and what? The same when I was in Oakland, I can remember growing uh, Thai and, and actually haze, the old haze. Mm. The old haze would still be going gangbusters in December. Mm -hmm. yeah. Slowly, I shouldn't say gangbusters because it all slows down because the, uh, the level of light is just diminishing, both in intensity and dur duration. Mm -hmm. right. so. The question was... Uh, okay. We've been talking to other cultivators with alternative methods of farming, right. so dry farming, no-till farming, and those are very uh, classic styles of agriculture. Right. You know, no, uh, dry farming is when there's no irrigation, right? I mean, uh, that's still done a lot in Southern California with certain berries crops and things like that. But yeah. and as far as cannabis, um, what also, do you think? Also, the no-till the no is also something that people have done for, I don't know, centuries maybe. Uh, no, I haven't seen these, though. I haven't seen these. Uh, you know, I, basically I've seen uh, just standard growing. I mean, I've seen it both ways. I've seen it with feminized seeds. I've seen it with, uh, you know, just going in there and getting the males out before they flower. Uh, spacing all different, depends on what they think, uh, the size of the plant they expect to get out of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, you know, it's going to be all different ways. It's, it's Again, it, it'll come down to the, the uh, person's own personal data, their database, whether it's in their mind or it's actually logged right in, of what works best for them, right? You know, I've seen people, when it was illegal, grow plants very close together and try to get a lot of plants, and now they want to grow many fewer plants, but much, much larger plants. So, you know, yeah, this will start to flush out as different people, because whether you're profitable or not, is what's going to determine how long you last. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, and for me, I mean, so you talk about, you know, dry farming. Um, you know, I haven't seen it done with cannabis. I've seen it done with dozens of other crops. But does it actually mm -hmm. add value to the market? Not really. Yeah. I mean, I think in our, you know, dynamic market, uh, the market will, you know, will make those decisions. I mean, one of the things I've seen is just the hand trimming aspect. Uh, while I still think that's the absolute best one, I mean, I've done it probably a dozen times over the last 12 months where we had 20 pounds of a strain and half of it was hand trimmed, the other half was a light machine trimmed on it. I couldn't get a dollar more for the hand trim stuff. Sure, it looked better, but it only looked marginally better. And while that increased our labor costs substantially to produce those pounds. Yeah, no, the aesthetics did not add a perceived amount of value to actually recoup the cost of actually generating that perceived value, if that makes sense. Um, because it's just a very dynamic market right now and there's a seasonality to it, right? Like right now we're in the middle of February, things are a bit slow, right? <laughs> sales goes, but as soon as people get their tax returns, man, their sales go right back up. Um, <laughs> maybe not so much this year. <laughs> yeah, maybe, yeah, so that's a whole other discussion right. for that one. Um, but as far as, um, you know, no-till farming, uh, we use a method of that and the no-till farming is meant to you know, increase the microbial density in the soil, mm -hmm. right? Um, it's right. meant to, and that's really important for and organics. And the structure of the right. soil. Yeah, exactly, that right. soil right. food web. Right. Um, we use a modified version of that, and I think that's important because I think 
for our style of cultivation, that really increases the quality of the plant. Like, you know, we use uh, mostly organics, um, and with organics, um, it's like painting with a, with a very large palette of colors. The plant can absorb, you know, multiple sources of nitrogen from, you know, guanos and f different meals and things like that. Whereas if you're using, you know, nitrates or synthetic fertilizers, the plant's only able to absorb from one source of that product. It can mm. only absorb, like, so much. Right. But if you have 12 different sources of them, right. or whatever you know, input you're having, then it could actually take all that all in, metabolize it, and get a much better yield out of that. Right. So yes, that no-till method does have benefits, but you have to understand how it works and works within your cultivation system. I mean, I've seen a lot of guys, like you know, the raised planter beds. Mm -hmm. Have you ever seen that work at scale? No. Yeah, me neither, right? right? Because I mean, like, just so you know, raised planter beds, they're, you know, uh, just tall boxes of soil that's living and you don't typically replace that soil uh, every harvest. You're, uh, you're always reusing the same soil over and over again. But what I've seen happen at scale, if one thing goes wrong with that mm -hmm. soil, like root aphids, right. yeah. <laughs> you're screwed because you're dependent upon that soil having that certain kind of nutritional uh, microbial mix right. to give the plant what it needs when it needs mm -hmm. it. But then if something goes wrong, if you've got 10,000 square feet of greenhouse, yeah. Yeah, you're going to have a lot of right. problems with that. So. Um, Again, it, it has a place, but you have to know where to put it. Yeah, the whole thing with growing outdoors is, is like any farming. You know, it, it's, you're going to have your, your good days and your bad days and your good crops and your bad crops. You know? I'd be terrified uh, of growing outdoors. You know, <laughs> growing outdoors here, uh, you know, just my experience with growing at my own place is uh, just the budworms are devastating, right? Which means you, you're going to have to... Either you're going to have to net the entire crop, or you're going to have to do BT the entire crop, right? And the BT works wonders. It works great if you're consistent with it. It works perfectly great. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, you know, a lot of people just think they're going to put the seeds in the ground, and they're going to water them, and they're going to pull it out. They're not. They're going to have all those kinds of problems you have when you're a farmer. And the additional problem is that your st stuff is going to be really scrutinized in terms of how clean it is. So there's a lot of new entrants coming into the market, like a lot of big money yeah. guys, big players. Um, what kind of advice do you have for these guys who are ready to drop millions of dollars in this industry when they've never grown a plant or you know, never sold a bud in their life? Find real master growers yeah. first. Yeah. Agreed. <laughs> and good design teams to design the facility. Mm -hmm. But how would, you have, like, how would you even know one? I mean, like, so this is the kind of a question I get all the time, well, what makes a good master grower? Um, I think I'm a master grower because I've earned it. I mean, I've been doing this for 10 years and I've had a lot of successes and, and I've developed a style of cultivation that I think adds a lot of high quality and consistency, but I don't really know like what to tell someone and how to identify some of those traits. I mean, let's say like, you know, we got a millionaire over here and he's about to, well, you know, build a green, massive greenhouse, but how, does, how is he supposed to hire that master grower? Uh, well, if I was that millionaire, yeah. I would, I would go to a place that was highly successful mm -hmm. and get their master grower to interview master growers. Ah, there you go. Well, hmm. That could be another consulting Yeah, this should be your job. <laughs> <laughs> with all this free time I have, right? <laughs> um, yeah. The yeah. hell with this, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, this like, supervising an entire greenhouse. I'm in the, I'm in the wrong business. Right. I should just consult, right? <laughs> That's funny. Uh, I've got a friend who owns a la uh, compliance lab here in L.A. that we use CanaSafe. And... Uh, we're always going back and forth. It's like, I'm in the wrong game. I should be doing lab testing. And then he looks at me. He's like, no, I'm in the wrong game. I should be growing weed. It's like, yeah. It's like, right. You know, right. grass is always green on the other side, though, right? Yes. <laughs> um, What's kind of some of the, like, you're at scale. You're kind of, you're not licensed in the way. You're kind of doing no. your own thing. So, like, what are you experimenting with? Myself? Genetic-wise. Yeah, as I was going to say, what are you working on? All right. Uh, well, when I have a really good cl uh, clone, I feminize it. I feminize it because I can't maintain all these clones. Right? But uh, feminizing doesn't mean you're going to get an identical plant at all. all right? It's still a mix of genes, even if it's coming from the same plant. Like I, I'll, uh, you know, I'll cause, cause uh, let two or three branches on a plant to, flower, uh, to uh, transition to male flowering. Right? Collect that pollen pollinate the, the branches that are still female and then grow out some of those clones the next year and none of them will have the same uh, terpene profile as the original did, right? Which is very disappointing because I'm usually choosing plants that I want to propagate because they have a really great nose and a nice eye. 
but I also have been doing stuff with uh, uh, CBD varieties, all right, feminizing those, but also crossing them with uh, good THC varieties. And I have F1s and F2s that this year here will be grown out to see what kind of different ratios we, we get and try to figure out how this really works in terms of the CBD and the THC. This is my first uh, time doing this. I was kind of surprised at the results. I had crossed a, uh, I think it was a, what was called tsunami. I'm, I suspect it was a diesel that tested about 10% CBD and no THC. And I crossed that with a jack that outdoors was testing at 20% THC, no CBD. So I thought, what, what am I going to get out of this? Well, I didn't get anything I expected. I, what I got was 12% CBD and 6% uh, THC. It was a perfect two to one ratio, but it wasn't anything that I envisioned was going to happen. So th that's why this year I'm, I've already got the seeds. I'm prepared to do this. So I'll work with another grow where we can grow uh, you know, many, many more than I can do with my little grow and start to see if we can make some sense of how these ratios uh, will come out, you know, and then we can better plan on how, how we do this. I don't know if there's going to be a real market for, uh, uh, you know, the CBD uh, crossed with, C, uh, with THC CBD flowers uh, because this may all be done by the extracts where they can get exactly the ratio that you want. How many people, if they're taking, uh, you know, a mix of CBD and THC, uh, they're taking it most likely for some medicinal purpose. And if they're doing that, they can always get the exact ratio. But, you know, I want to be able to produce uh, strains that will have those ratios anyway, if people want to smoke them. One of the things that I think will be a marketable flower that has CBD is something that has a good amount of THC. Let's say it has... 15% THC, and it has 5% CBD. Because I think that's something that people can smoke, they can get high, they're not gonna get paranoid, they're not gonna get anxious because the CBD is there. Right. 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 Well, one of the, the main uh, objection to uh, smoking uh, these high THC things is, is people, especially novices, because they smoke too much, they do. They get paranoid or they get very anxious on it, you know. And the CBD does counteract that. So. Now, I think there will be a market for, you know, higher CBD flour. I mean, we grow Harlequin, which was one of the original, you know, right. two-to-one ratios. I got it from Harborside Health Center back in, like, 2010. Um, but that's a really medicinal strain. I mean, that's one of the strains that we don't covet. Like, if anyone wants the cut, right. we will freely give that out because it has a lot of medical benefits to it. But I can't sell it to save my life yeah. <laughs> because um, the real medicinal users are switching to extracts. Uh, it used to have a good presence on the shelf years ago. Um, you know, shops like to have mm -hmm. a high CBD strain, just to sure. say, because that was still when we were back all medical collective and whatnot. Um, but nowadays... Uh, yeah, all the extracts have gone away, or all, all the CBDs have moved all the extracts. Right. But yeah, I would love a you know, 10, 15 percent THC and 5 CB, uh, right. CBD flour. So. Yeah, just one quick question on, on a commercial scale. Can you talk about how you go through the process of phenol hunting and, uh, and then how you identify and how many like, you have to call out before you actually find the type of one? Yeah, um, so phenol hunting, right? Phenol hunting. Well, I, I always. Uh, <clears throat> I would look for the structure and make sure that, you know, I like the branching on it, I like the flower formation on it, it's nice tight buds, those sort of things, whether it was healthy and vigorous grower. Uh, and then to choose between ones that were fairly similar, I would just be, you know, rubbing the, the stems, branches, and, and trying to see what kind of a nose it had, whether it was strong or, or not strong, so forth. And then ultimately it's, it's what they actually turn out to be afterwards. But you have to breed those things to begin with. So you have a number of candidates that you breed, and then you see you know, what comes out of that. Yeah. It's a process, and it's, it's, I'd say experience really helps a lot. Uh, and uh, sometimes you're surprised at what comes out. I mean, really, I've seen some very strange things happen. I mean, one of the ones was, this, if any of you have heard of Brack City, uh, Brack City is this 
came out of uh, oh, uh, virtual Las Vegas is one of the grows there that I I consult with, and uh, they crossed a Doctor Who with a, a something else. I think they had some bubble gum that I had given them. Wow, well, they had a number of things go into this, and what happened is that the Brax, which I hope you all know, are actually where all those resin glands are. The, that's the, the female flowers. A lot of people call those calyxes. It's not true at all. They're bracts. The calyx you can't even see on a female flower. Uh, anyway, the, it's called Brax City because the bracts are about three or four times as large as you see on a, on a regular plant. I mean, they're, they're like that size. Right. So that was just something that happened. And it turned out to be a wonderful cut. And yeah, for you, as like a... Right. You breed a lot of these things, so I'm guessing your pheno hunt's a lot shorter than ours, but for us, uh, it takes about nine months from the day we pop a seed to the day we have a commercial amount of product for, mm -hmm. like us, that's about 20 pounds. Um, yeah, it's about a nine-month process, and because we're always, you know, we start with 12, you know, 12 pack of seeds, and then, you know, sex test them mm -hmm. through Phylos Labs, and that goes down to six females if we're lucky. Um, and then those six, you got to keep all the moms on it. So it takes up a lot of bench space. It does, right. Yeah, it takes a long time, and it like, and it costs like our estimates for us like over that nine month period and the wasted bench space because now under the current regulations, if you want to sell that each pheno hunt or, or each a phenotype or each um, you know one two three four five six, mm -hmm. that's a different strain with a seven hundred and fifty dollar compliance test that you need to pay uh, if you could even sell it to market. Right. right. Uh, so <coughs> it's about a hundred grand well. because of a lost. Uh, revenue from that t mm -hmm. bench space you're taking up, and we only have a 70% success rate, right? Maybe 60. Well, we're actually, okay, here's something that we pheno hunted for nine months, and then it didn't work. <laughs> right. <laughs> like none of them did. So, it's an investment, and it's almost like I would argue intellectual property. And at some at some point, where it's like, you know, we found this one, and you know, we might not have exclusive rights to it, right. but this is definitely like something that, you know, our company has, so it's Well, it's this, this brings up something else, and that is, is that the tissue culture, mm -hmm. and also the, the, the testing. Mm -hmm. The testing is just getting more and more sophisticated, where you're actually going to be able to tell uh, what kind of profile it has in terms of tripping, and you know, whether it's going to be pretty strong in, in, uh, in cannabinoids also. Mm -hmm. But uh, the tissue culture will eventually, I'm sure, replace the whole mother cloning thing. Oh yeah, we're putting I'm tissue just, culture in terms of space. Facility. I mean, it's just ridiculous that it's not, you know, that you wouldn't do it. I mean, yeah, our next facility, we're going to be doing yeah, yeah. Uh, tissue culture and turn those uh, straight into moms and take the cuts right. off those moms because tissue culture is just great to really revigor the plant and revitalize mm -hmm. it because you know keeping mother stock is challenging. It's a high right. skill set like. I have one employee at my facility, that's his only job, right. and he's great at it. Um, and if I didn't have him, we'd be taking cuts off of our vegging stock, um, which are always healthy and robust. But when you have to you know, walk around 6,000 square feet of space to get you know, a couple thousand cuts off a plant, that takes several days. Right. So you know, having a good, healthy mother stock is important. Yeah. But anything past our scale, I think that'd be really difficult. Right. So we're going to be you know, getting a tissue culture lab all set up and everything. And you know, I think a lot of the advances um, that we're going to be using it's, it's from big ag and sort of you know a lot of data and technology uh, i don't think we're going to be having drones you know mm -hmm. manicuring our plants yeah. just yet uh there's still always going to be that human element but yeah um it's yeah. it's going to take a while so. yeah i can remember uh, trichome technologies which is out of oakland uh, uh ken morrow uh, still writes for canvas business times mm -hmm. uh i remember when i visited his grow that was the first time i saw uh you know a motherless grow mm -hmm. because he just lollipopped his plants right they would grow he would lollipop take those bottom ones and thought that's what he you know he then rooted mm -hmm. those and so it was just a perpetual thing like that i did that for years yeah. actually exactly. because my problem was yeah. i couldn't train someone to maintain the mother stock well mm -hmm. right because if your mothers start degrading you're going to have like you know uh really root weak cuttings which will lead to weak, weak veg right. weak veg but if your veg isn't set up right you're going to have mm -hmm. a bad flowering time so so we would just keep you know focus really heavily on the vegetative cycle make sure everything was dialed in take your cuts off that flip into flower a few days later um and then flower is pretty much on autopilot if you mm -hmm. had you know really good right. veg but at this size uh yeah the mother's we're playing a pretty important role but even then it's like you know we're in the middle of winter we're trying to right. veg those things out we're in a greenhouse uh, it takes a lot more light uh, yeah. to keep them well. So yeah, we're definitely moving towards tissue culture. 
and yeah, and some of those more big ag practices and things like that that I think do have an, a home in cannabis, especially at scale. Um, and yeah, that's just things that we have to you know adjust to as we get this so much bigger. Right. So. <laughs> um, Onward, upward, right? Yeah. Okay. So the question was, when you say scale, what do you mean? Yeah. I think that's anything above 10 employees, honestly. Um, you know, I've scaled up other kinds of companies before, um, you know, manufacturing-based companies, and once you hit that kind of 10 people, that's when your level of communication just gets exponentially more intense. Because now if I'm telling you something, well, now you have to tell someone else to do something as well, <laughs> and that just level of communication has to just get much, much more robust, right? And we're at 40 full-time employees right now, so I've, you know, gone quite a bit past that. So I found, you know, when it was myself, if I was doing things one way, then I had three employees, then I had to change up everything I did, and I hit 10. That was a whole other dynamic shift. And then I hit 30 again, or 30, that was another big dynamic shift of like actually scaling up. So I think anything... I'm looking more at employees because at least for cultivation, ours is like, it's very tacit knowledge. It's like the knowledge that we've gained, you know, over the years, it's very hard to transfer and to translate to other people. Like, if I can show you a plant, I think, like, you and I could tell you, like, there's a dozen things wrong with it. But if I try to explain it to someone who doesn't have that knowledge, that's very, very hard. It's like, well, it doesn't look that the right kind of green, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, well, why? And it's like, then you have to go back in your data and understand that and make sure you understand all the moving parts in a facility. Um, so anything past that 10, you have to have a lot of SOPs or a very good uh, system in place to get you past that. Otherwise, you're going to be doing, or the quote-unquote master grower, is going to be doing 90% of the work, and while all those other employees are just kind of like little helpers, getting him done who can't be critical thinkers, right? And especially when you need to have like data available and make people make decisions based on that data, um, that's really hard. Yeah. And I think too, it's like scaling. It's like a, a you know. It's very challenging, and scaling just to scale doesn't make sense either. I mean, how many mega grows are out there right now in California? Like hundreds of thousands of square foot yeah. in Carpinteria and Santa Barbara and things like that. And yeah, sure, they're pumping out like thousands of pounds a week, but it's all garbage, and it's all going for extracts, and they're barely making any money. Um, so I think for... Uh, we sell through distributors throughout California. Just flour, yeah. We don't do extracts or anything yet. Like, um, we will be doing that soon. Uh, same, with the one, same with the ones that I collaborate with and, and uh, advise. It's all flour. Uh, mm -hmm. Because these are really high end. They're very, very well done. Right? It's, uh, everything that they grow is sold at top dollar. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Um, what, what? Yeah, so the question was, you know, what, what factors uh, are involved in deciding what phenotype that we're gonna select for the market. Um, for me, yeah, there's a multitude of decisions. One, uh, if the flowering time is right. Like, our, our facility is really designed around an eight week flowering cycle, and we've selectively feed on hunted and bred all of our cultivars and strains uh, to fit right into that nicely, so it has to meet that. It has to have good yield well. It has to have a good aroma. It has to fit within our portfolio and kind of our, our brand as well. Um, Currently, uh, my company, Palomar, uh, has 20 different strains that we rotate on a bi-weekly basis. So we'll have, uh, you know, over a course of, say, uh, two months, we'll have four harvests. And three of those harvests are all different. So we'll have set one, two, three, one. And that really helps with our, um, you know, design scarcity in the market. Like, years ago, I was growing nothing but blackberry kush. I was crushing it. And then one day, everybody stopped buying it. I was like, crap. And it took me months to reset and get a new cut in there and things like that. So we rotate ours, and that's where the mother stock comes into play and just be able to pull that. It brings up the market. Yeah. The market is really what determines it. You know, you put, the, you put your stuff out there, and you get back from the dispensaries that this stuff disappeared in a week, you know, and you've got this other stuff that's still there five, six weeks later. You kind of know what you should be growing. Yeah. So that's really what determines it. And that's, yeah, yeah that's exactly right. Um, but I mean, like, you know, the cookies strain, right? I can't grow cookies to save my life for some reason. Like I'm just, the system doesn't work. I'm not good at it. Um, yeah. So there's so many different cookies right. in actuality. <laughs> all different cuts. Well, for me, they just, they never yielded very well. No, like, they don't, they're small buds. Right, yeah. and yeah. that's 
like a really high cost to produce and I couldn't get more per pound for it. So it's like that just didn't make sense for us economically, even though it flew off the shelf. I just couldn't get the m kind of wholesale price point I needed mm -hmm. to make it economically viable for our cultivation yeah. system. So there's a lot of factors, but I mean, I'd say that, yeah, what the market will bear, but making sure it fits into your own production cultivation system, making sure, um, yeah. you know, all those things fit uh, is really important. Yeah, some of them, I mean, just basically, you know, one cultivar will yield more under the same conditions than another one will. Mm -hmm. I mean, and that, that plays a big part. All those things play a part. And that's important too, like you can have, like we have some heavy yielding strains, we have some lower yielding ones, but they all have a place in there because the slightly y lower yielding one, um, you know, might help the other ones sell as well. Like they're like support strains almost, where it's like you have the really popular, you know, Gorilla Glue or whatnot or wedding, wedding cake, um, but you also have some other ones that are really complementary to that because people that's listening in Southern California, they'll buy an eighth of this and their normal one, but they might want to buy a gram of that other one. And so having that variety for a cultivator uh, is really important. It keeps you and the market engaged and your buyers engaged as well. So. I haven't seen wedding cake yet. I mean, in person. Uh, <laughs> but it looks really frosty. I got wedding crasher. Seen, right? <laughs> yeah. So that's a wedding cake cross with okay. a purple punch, actually. So. Okay, any more, any more questions? Um, so what's one of the strains that you're still chasing from your youth? Well, I'm not chasing it anymore, but I, I wish I had the original Durban poison. I mean, that went to Amsterdam and became something entirely different. Uh, not entirely different, but quite different. But the f first one that I ha had, the one that I really liked, uh, uh, actually, I just lost it. It never went to Amsterdam. What went to Amst I had two different lines of the Durban. I had an, an A and a B. And, the A happened to be the one that I liked the most. It had a, a real licorice flavor. It had purple stigmas, which you just don't see, you know. Uh, purple, with some of them were lavender. Uh, that I wish I had, you know. What you have now is a much more commercial kind of rendition of what went to Amsterdam. Uh, part of that problem was that I made a mistake. I, it's really embarrassing, but I gave Skunk Me and Sam uh, Afghani one, and I gave him the Durban, the B line, but the B line had a little bit of hermaphrodism in it. And uh, I, I didn't realize it when I gave it to him at the time, and I didn't find this out until many years later when he told me he had to work with it, work with it, work with it to get rid of the hermaphrodism, right? So that was part of what uh, changed that, that line a lot. But it's a heavier yielder now. Uh, it's not as sativa-like as it was when I first got it, but it was the most unusual plant that I, uh, I would say, uh, variety that I grew. I've seen individuals that were pretty spectacular, but as a variety, it was just very different from anything else. The main thing was this, is what a short season it was. You know, I, I grew that. Uh, you were harvesting it here in Oakland in September, and when I brought it to New York, uh, um, this is about 60 miles from New York City. Uh, we were harvesting some of that in August. I mean, it was that, that early. So the, in, in being from the East originally, my whole thing with breeding when I came out here was to develop uh, cultivars that could mature back East before the terrible weather came in, right? Because the people I knew who grew back there, they were basically growing leaf a really crappy Mexican that had some flowers, right? And when uh, I saw a situation out there where I went back, I already had uh, hybrids, F1s of, of things like uh, Afghani and Congolese, Afghani and Nigerian, Afghani and Durban and so forth. But I went back and I took those sativa crosses and I, I back crossed them again to Afghani to try to make sure that we got the shortness of Afghani in there. and. Uh, they did fantastic out there. I mean, those people couldn't believe how strong that pot was. They had never experienced anything like it in their lives. Uh, so that was. That's pretty cool. I don't actually, know where that's going, but anyway. <laughs> I just want you guys to realize that frame of reference too. It's like okay, like you were breeding stuff to grow in New York back when it was still super illegal. Like yeah, it was, one seed it was. would get you thrown in jail for a year. <laughs> uh, I, I'll tell you that. <laughs> that, that year it was a very successful year. We grew over 500 pounds of, of top notch. I mean, really top notch since the mayor. And uh, these guys wanted to do it again the next year, and they were bringing in money people, right? <laughs> Who were just drug dealers. And uh, 
I didn't feel good about it. I didn't like the people. I didn't like the fact that they wanted to upscale so much. You know, it all became, it all became the money. You know, I was more interested in, in the actual growing and seeing what happened and all that. So uh, the next year they, they, they bought 140 acres uh, further away from where we originally grew and uh, went at it. And I was back in California when I got a call in, in July uh, to come out there and help them and I didn't really want to do that. Uh, but I, I relented because a few of the people, they had sunk everything they had into it. So I went back there to rescue them. And this was hard to believe. They had gone through a whole year of growing this very successful crop and didn't seem to have learned anything because they went from a place that we were growing in, in like bottom land, really rich, beautiful soil. I mean, we had to do nothing to the soil, really. You could put your hand in it, it was, and just reach this beautiful soil. So it was really easy to grow there. Uh, so where did, they, where did they buy this land? They bought it at, you know, another 1,000, 1,500 feet higher, uh, where the soil was rocky and sandy. And additionally, New York State that year had a, had a drought. So yeah, you, I come and look at the plants, they have no, no nutrients and no water, no water they're not growing. <laughs> so anyway, I, I, I kind of remedied that and got them growing well. And uh, sometime in uh, late August, I had to come back to Oakland and uh, so I said, you know, I'll, I'll be back and we'll be ready to harvest. Now this crop would have been over a ton, would have been over a ton. Uh, but uh, as I was flying back, they got busted, right? So they lost everything. None of them ended up in jail, uh, partly because New York didn't understand growing at that time. Like they didn't understand. The year before I was standing in this, this wonderful fields and uh, one of the the guys came out and he showed me a local newspaper. The headline was that they estimated that the New York State uh, marijuana crop that year would be worth a half a million dollars, right? And I'm thinking, it's worth more right here, you know? <laughs> I mean, that's how little they knew about it. So when they got busted the next year, they didn't end up in jail, they just lost everything. They lost a fortune, right, so. They were lucky uh, back then, though. <laughs> they were lucky for that, but you know, I mean, I never got busted in my life, never been arrested. And a lot of it had to do with luck, and, and a lot of it had to do with the fact that I didn't personally sell marijuana. Uh, I didn't sell seeds, I didn't sell anything. You know, I made money from my writing and my photography. Uh, and the other was that I didn't take, except, uh, you know, all these offers that come to, come to Hawaii, come to here, you know, uh, you know, do the growing for us, you know, you'll make a lot of money. And that wasn't really my interest so much. You know, I really was fascinated with the plant, the botany, and uh, that's the way I went. So. Any other questions? Yeah. Great. All right. Thanks. Hope you enjoyed it.